Hey guys, last year we looked at an early production prototype of a Commarker B4 desktop fiber laser engraver. A small 20 watt model with a Q-switched Max Photonics source. A capable little machine, but it met its fate and was cruelly eviscerated for our entertainment. Uh oh, now we are in trouble. It has apparently called its bigger brother, who also goes by the name of Commarker B4, but seems to weigh 10 times as much. This one no longer gets the benefit of the doubt, of the early prototype. It is a finished retail model, with supposedly a cream of the crop 60 watt JPT MOPA fiber laser source inside. This should be interesting. Let's see if Commarker B4 can take revenge and bring honor to the family name. In the past I've only had the pleasure of testing laser engravers with 20 watt and below average power. The 60 watt source that this unit is shipped with is quite a large step up. And I think it's getting close to the limits of what makes sense to put in one of these desktop enclosures. Like these are primarily meant for surface level marking and decoration. There are few materials whose surfaces you can't attack with a 20 watt pulsed laser already. The advantages that a higher average power brings to your table are speed, depth of cutting and bragging rights mostly. But I'm sure we will find some interesting applications to leverage this immense power. Oh nice, they've upgraded the included safety goggles. Two real glass lenses with a thin film coating. We'll test those in a moment. With immense power comes immense weight and volume. This thing is a certified chonker. Not sure if it's unique in this regard, but certainly unusual. Normally at these higher power levels you are more likely to get a separate head stand and power supply laser source control box. I'm not seeing huge advantages in either of these methods. I guess an all-in-one com marker will take up a little bit less real estate overall. Whereas a separate box could be placed more flexibly, on the floor below a desk or outside of a safety enclosure for example. This thing is fat, no two ways about it, but it has everything it needs to function hidden away neatly in that base plate. Assembly is super simple, even if you have never assembled anything else before. One grub screw connects the Z-axis lead screw to a gearbox motor in the base. Four bolts attach the Z-axis to the thread grid plate. And another four bolts attach the head to the Z-axis. Assembly done and we are ready to pew pew basically. This manufacturer did not have any silly reservations about me opening the machine. So I'm happy to report that everything in here is better than last time. I will find something to complain about, it's in my German nature. But the Commarker assembly team have improved big time down here and that's good to see. So we are good to go 10 minutes after unpacking, more teardown later. There's a pre-configured EasyCAD 2 Lite software copy, included on a USB stick, instantly ready to use. Love do not hear it, it's actually nearly silent in standby. The fans are only spinning up in longer higher power operation. In the past I was skeptical about the Z-axis power feed through DC gearbox motor. Because it puts up a fight whenever you try to use the hand crank. With this crazy tall machine I must reconsider my opinion. Hand cranking a 500mm Z-axis would be a waste of time. Here power feed is justified. It could be even better if the manufacturer used a stepper motor for this purpose. That way one could automate deep 3D engraving operations. Automatically lowering the focal plane a tenth of a millimeter after every round of engraving. You can physically fit half a meter high victims between the base plate and the head. However, the standard field lens that was included has a 200mm focal length, which has to be accounted for. You can also utilize this gigantic height as an expansion of the working area. An optional field lens for a 250 by 250 mm working area has a 380 mm focal length for example. So such a tall machine is very nice to have, but I am going to continue with the smaller area lens for the time being. Because I believe that gives me the smallest focal point diameter. Here's another ridiculous size comparison of the Commarker B4 from before. Comfortably sitting in the lap of Commarker B4. 
I've shown plenty of 1064 nanometer versus normal material samples in past videos, but I've learned some new tricks along the way so I'll repeat a few of the basic examples and work my way slowly to more interesting advanced applications. I learned for example that I wasn't using the maximum scan speed efficiently. I practically never let any of these engravers go faster than 1000 mm per second, for fear of losing quality. In my small scale experiments it didn't matter much, but for those who are interested in using a com marker B4 productively to earn money, it might be worth noting that the manufacturer specified insane 10,000 mm per second are actually totally usable. You only have to have correct time constants configured, which will keep the effects of mirror inertia or delays in the laser power output in check no matter what max velocities may have been reached. Well, 10,000 seems to be pushing it a little bit, but I'll be aiming for 7,000 or so from now on, saving time whenever an operation features long straight lines. Here are the time constants I found optimal for most purposes. The laser on, end and polygon TCs were a bit longer in the manufacturer's prepared profile. Let's try and engrave some images on coated or anodized metal parts. Probably the most popular and lucrative application for these smaller engravers. Perpetuating awesome black and white photography on black anodized aluminium parts has to be one of my favorite things to do here, it always leads to stunning results. Usually things that look good on a computer screen could use a little nudge in contrast. These are my parameters for indulgence more or less. If you're on the clock, you could use lower DPI settings for faster processing and get virtually indistinguishable results. Pretty good, but not that hard to do. Even a simple blue diode laser can give you similar results on anodized, coated or painted metal surfaces. This is easy mode in other words. What makes a powerful pulsed infrared laser such as this more desirable is its ability to also attack bare uncoated metals and practically all materials in general except for transparent ones such as glass or clear acrylic. We can use the very same settings to burn photos into uncoated metals, but that often leads to low contrast and viewing angle dependence. So for this purpose I would like to propose a slightly more time consuming recipe, which will however lead to much higher quality eraser heads. First I'll duplicate my photo and trace its outlines. Those will be filled evenly by laser engraving, with these settings that encourage growth of a dark surface oxide layer. Then I'll use the second image instance and light burns dithering to selectively remove some points of that discolored surface and create a much more reliable engraving. We basically grew our own coating and are now selectively removing it just like before. Much better, but still child's play. Our smaller, cheaper com marker with a Q-switched fiber laser source could have done the same. The big advantage that the exquisite JPT Master Oscillator Fiber Amplifier source in here gives us is super fine control over average power and impulse timing, allowing you to rain absolute destruction on materials that need it, such as slate or natural stone. Or it can be super gentle and just add a superficial non-destructive surface discoloration. To mark or decorate sensitive objects like smartphones, earbuds or laptops. And of course everything in between. It does take a fair bit of trial and error to find perfect parameters for every new material and desired look. And even though this is a popular source nowadays, there aren't many resources out there on the internet that give you straight up working parameters. Especially color engraving on stainless and titanium, kind of the headline features of this product is very difficult to get just right. I mean, no surprise there. We are thermally growing a surface oxide layer, whose thickness determines the color effect. A difference of tens of nanometers can change apparent colors drastically, 
That's why every little variable matters. Field lens, substrate thickness, focal length, probably small day-to-day -day variations in alloys and ambient temperatures too. So these material test grids that you do sometimes see published on the internets are not really that helpful, at least in my experience. I would say whenever you do want to utilize this capability, just order 500% of the material and prepare to do lots of systematic testing. But yeah, if you have like one common product with never changing properties, you probably only have to invest the time to dial in your commarker B4 settings to perfection once. Or if you're making very high value, unique products, custom knives or artisan woodworking or machine tools or something like that. I'd say with some experience you can find good settings in about an hour experimentally. Theoretically speaking, the thin film interference that causes this effect is a continuum. A smooth transition without jumps. If you can create every arbitrary oxide layer thickness, you should also be able to create every color in the visible spectrum. Practically I found that everything is viewing angle dependent, like Pikachu looks a bit ill from this perspective, doesn't it? And some colors like a real spectrally pure red are very hard to reach. Everything wants to be shades of brown and aubergine. All that being said, it does this and it's blowing my mind every time. Such a fun and useful ability to have at one's disposal. Truly amazing and there are many more to come. An optional feature that you can order together with your B4 is a rotary axis. It costs $250 extra at the moment. For that you're getting the advanced JCZ controller card, prepared with IOs for an additional motion axis, an external stepper motor driver that plugs into the rear of the engraver, and the actual third axis which is basically a lathe chuck attached to a stepper motor. I don't know, seems nice to have but honestly I don't use that a whole lot. Uh, evidently, I immediately made a mistake in my first attempt of marking this black cylinder. Com markers instructions are actually correct here. I just overlooked the reverse direction bit. In a jewelry context you could use this to offer wedding rings with a personal engraving. Me, I'm more tempted to cannibalize the hardware to motorize my z-axis. Not an option, but included by default I think is this focusing aid, with which you can add a fixed distance ring to the head, for handheld point and shoot operation. I'll be honest with you, that one I also don't plan to use on a daily basis. But you know, it's there, and the head has this nice convenient handle, as well as a manual fire button. Uh-huh, that is wonderful and scary and sketchy in equal measures. I mean it's cool that it's possible, but there is still no activity indicator LED on the head and no emergency stop button. It already takes a fair bit of recklessness to operate these desktop machines outside of an opaque interlocked enclosure. Manual aiming takes that to the next level. Of course, our powerful MOPA source, just like every other pulsed infrared laser, is very happy to preferentially attack rust on a steel surface. It also slowly ablates the healthy steel, so not suitable for precision surfaces such as pistons. And you wouldn't use such a fancy precise machine for cleaning purposes anyway. You could in a pinch. Yeah, hand holding is not for me, but there you go. Alright, a few more thoughts about the machine before we really go to town and push it to its limits. The thread grid plate still uses through holes. Easy and cheap to manufacture, but whenever you ablate metal parts above, all the conductive dust can fall right through and enter the laser source through its cooling fans, or get in touch with the controller cart or the mains power supply. Therefore a plate with blind holes would be nicer, but more expensive. 
There is an easy fix that either the manufacturer or customers can apply themselves. According to JPT's manual for this M7 fiber laser, the bend diameter for their beam delivery cable has to be at least 15 cm. Otherwise a power loss in the fiber can occur. And that lost power will not vanish into thin air. If it ever amounts to an appreciable portion of the full 60 watt output power, it could easily damage the fiber's polymer cladding and make losses even worse. The Commarker team is obviously aware of this 15 cm number and have arranged this coil accordingly. However, this section here where it goes around the corner is too tight for my taste. I'll reroute that slightly. The rest of the construction in here is much better than last time, but not exactly world class. In my opinion that's okay, because at the time of publishing this video, the whole machine costs only $500 more than the 20 watt MOPA from the competition we looked at recently, while being three times as powerful nominally. According to an Ophir L30C continuous wave power sensor, the machine exceeds its average output power slightly. Not that there was any doubt about it meeting its specification. It was delivered with a test certificate of one of the most reputable fiber laser source manufacturers in China. They also specify an operating lifespan greater than 100,000 hours. That would be more than 11 years of continuous lasing. I don't think the M7 has been around for 11 years, so it's hard to prove. But since it's a complete solid state system, I don't find that hard to believe either. The obligatory safety remark. You know the drill. This thing vastly exceeds what it takes to be a class 4 laser. As such there is a long list of safety features that have to be implemented for it to be considered safe to be operated by a human. This is how a safe machine looks. Commarker B4 has no safety features worth mentioning. That's how the manufacturer can sell this incredibly capable machine for an incredibly low price by western standards. You should consider it a component for building a safe machine yourself. And absolutely not operated out in the open as I'm showing here in this video. I take this risk to film interesting footage, rather than showing you a fully enclosed opaque box. That spits out a done part after 10 minutes of hissing. That wouldn't be any fun, would it? The manufacturer has included a freestanding orange acrylic shield. And a pair of safety goggles of higher quality than the usual $2 green plastic ones. These actually have real glass lenses with a thin film coating, presumably for high infrared reflectance. Assuming anything about personal protective equipment does not sound wise. And these don't have any markings or manufacturer info on them. Both the shield and the goggles do provide infrared attenuation. The shield negligible, the goggles are actually pretty good at first glance. But without a well-known brand name I'm still not going to rely on these. While trying to verify that the output pulse width really goes down all the way to 2 nanoseconds, I noticed one more small opportunity for improvement for the B4. This is its head and the Galvo scanner, the only thing that's audible in standby. I'm in here because I couldn't disable the red preview laser pointer. That's something that's normally possible with a JPT M7 source, and it would allow me to take cleaner readings with a photodiode. Turns out they are using an external additional laser diode and a dichroic beam combiner in here. As one might do with a pedestrian max photonics source that doesn't have this function built in. I guess this has the advantage of the red pointer being on all the time. Whereas JPT's pointer is mutually exclusive with the power output. I'm going to remove this though, because there has been a microscopic offset between the preview point and the actual working beam. You might still be able to see that in the rest of the video because I filmed this part after everything was already done. In my machine JPT's red dot enable input is connected to a pin 8 of the controller card. So I can now toggle that myself and put out nothing that could confuse my photodiode. While it tries to see some nanosecond pulse widths. Dealing with nanoseconds and below is tricky, even with the fanciest of oscilloscopes. I'm using a $50 indium gallium arsenide photodiode with a 0.2 nanosecond rise time, meant for high performance data transfer. I thought I could quickly build a 10 minute trans impedance amplifier for it, but failed miserably. Sub nanosecond rise times need gigahertz PCB designs and specifically chosen components. Here I'm just reverse biasing my photodiode with batteries. 
and am digitizing the current impulses through a 50 ohm resistor and a 50 ohm coax to the scope. Good enough to verify that we are indeed in the 2 nanosecond neighborhood. But to see something like the peak output power waveforms needs a lot more finesse. Not happening today. Instead, let's have some more fun now that the work is done. By popular demand, can it cut SMD stencils? Yes, single-use ones from plastic foils almost instantly. Good stainless ones need a bit of patience. Let's say you're running a repair business and you need an odd reballing stencil for an ICE-40 FPGA <laughs> ASAP. The tricky part here is not that the laser won't cut the 0.1mm stainless sheet. It can penetrate thicker material in seconds. What you want in an SMT stencil though are clean edges and no thermal buckling of the sheet. So what I like to do is add a short time delay in EasyCAD or just another slow job at zero power in Lightburn so that the material has a moment to cool down between passes. Patience is the hard part here. When you can obliterate metals and make the sparks fly effortlessly, it feels silly that a microscopic feature such as this should take 10 minutes. But in comparison to even an overnight delivery of a board stencil, these 10 minutes are nothing. Giving this process the time it needs and only short nanosecond impulses results in beautiful, immediately usable stencils right off the machine. Most likely you can discover faster settings or float the sheet metal on water for better cooling. For me this is awesome enough though. Cutting small pieces of sheet metal quickly, easily and precisely without going through my convoluted CNC workflow is an absolute revolution in my lab. I don't know yet in which order I'm going to release these videos. Only the Patreon and channel members surely know what these copper shims are for. How about wire welding? I've been preparing to build my own resistance standard out of a nickel chromium alloy wire. To reach useful resistance values without using kilometers of wire, the stuff has to be very thin, which makes it tricky to handle and to see even. Let's see if we can do something under a microscope. Traditionally spot welding the resistive element to an intermediate thin copper or bronze wire is said to be the most reliable PPM proof connection. Unfortunately at a low laser power level the thinnest copper wire I was able to find only gets polished bright and shiny whereas the nichrome wire just vanishes. It looks like we might have to do some thermal matching here. Or create a molten copper blob first into which the nichrome wire is then fed. Commarker is certainly able to help us out with this or with the creation of micro thermocouples. We just need some more control over the process, maybe a micro motion stage or some inert gas atmosphere. Pretty good though for an ignorantly improvised half hour experiment. How about we try to weld something a little bit more substantial than micrometer thin wires? Normally when thinking of laser welding, pulsed lasers are not really what comes to mind. That's usually a job for simpler and cheaper continuous wave machines. But the endlessly flexible JPT M7 source in here is prepared for that too. It lets you choose pulse widths between 2 nanoseconds, being abrasive, superficial and cool, and hundreds of nanoseconds all the way to continuous wave output, which would be more melty, deep and hot. To enable this continuous wave mode you simply specify a 1 nanosecond pulse width. For these unknown plastic parts I went with a very low power setting and slow speed and some wobble. So the beam will draw small circles over the line I specified and just be a bit more wide and melty. 
it's unlikely that these cheap plastic parts are suitable for laser welding, and that I was able to guesstimate the perfect parameters for this operation after only three attempts. Yet I have no doubt that this is another thing that Commarker B4 could do very well. If someone puts in the work and figures out good settings for a scenario, For me this is too stinky, so I'm not going to dive any deeper into plastic welding. Let's try a more friendly substance. Stainless sheet on stainless sheet. Keep in mind that when TIG welding stainless, you usually use argon as a shield gas. Had I done that here, we would not see the ugly brown oxidation. But lo and behold, this is a perfectly functional, very strong even, large diameter spot weld. It took me a few attempts as you can see, but for how good this result is, it was shockingly easy. Yep, that tears a hole into the material rather than coming apart. Kinda reminds me of another notorious spot weld that tends to do that. Time for the old nickel strip versus nickel plated 18650 steel casing. Yes, I have a window open within throwing distance should this trial run go horribly wrong. Why no, that looks great. The heat has demagnetized the little neodymium magnet with which I held the nickel strip in place. And so I assume it would also endanger the isolation ring that normally goes on the other side of the battery. There we would need different faster settings, but I'm going to consider the point made. It just doesn't end. This is a hermetic feed through, solderable pins in a blue glass seal, in a low carbon steel outer housing. Normal low temperature electronic solder never wets to steel. So there is no easy way for me to add this to a newly made copper sheet metal hermetic box or something. Or is there? Copper, silver and gold have excellent infrared reflectivity. They will simply shrug off a continuous wave attack. Well, below 60 watt at least. To get through to those materials we have to return to a pulsed operation. And unleash shortish bursts with kilowatts of power. Not too short. We don't want to just pulverize the surface. In my understanding, this is a balancing act. We need just enough impulse power to bring the heat, but not so much that we eject the molten material right away. This is a 500 nanosecond setting, and I think we are witnessing a successful intermetallic laser welding. I'm also involving a few micrometer of steel here, for which the settings are a bit too hot. At least I think that's what the escaping sparks are. Again, some inert shielding gas would be helpful here, because at such high temperatures everything becomes reactive. Not the sexiest result ever, admittedly. But this is only my third attempt, and mechanically it is attached strongly. I'd have to get a helium leak detector involved before calling this the greatest accomplishment of the day. Maybe some aggressive brazing flux would also help. Yeah, it looks like the molten steel has done most of the work in this case. But no doubt this too is something that Commarker B4 can pull off once the perfect settings have been researched. Oh well, we have at least 99,990 hours of life left in the source. This video has to end, even though I have another 99,000 ideas. Maybe I'm making another one once more familiar with the machine. Once I have a proper enclosure for it. The possibilities really are amazing. We knew about that. It's hard to name a technical problem that can't be solved by throwing a laser at it. One final exhibit for today. I've recently upgraded my CNC control cabinet 
To make good connections to the outside world, I need some rectangular and round holes. In, and you may want to sit down for this, powder coated 2mm steel sheet. It isn't the powder coating I'm worried about. Such thick steel would definitely be a job for the CNC milling machine. If only mine had a control cabinet currently. So let's try and laser cut some steel that is about twice as thick as I'm feeling comfortable with. If our com marker Mopa can do this, there would be many advantages. Lower effort cat and cam, rectangular corners, no tools wearing out, no pointy steel chips being created, only a bit of rust dust. But this is for sure going to be the heaviest lifting that my precious will ever have to do. I tried a few ideas on a piece of my old control cabinet such as cutting underwater, which might catch most of the dust, but will start impeding my laser beam after a minute or two. After pretty much perforating this whole piece, it looks more and more like the question isn't really whether or not the laser is powerful enough, but which settings will get us there the fastest, and with the least damage to the surroundings. The biggest issue is aspect ratio. Our cuts are deeper than they are wide. The first few passes in an operation are still nice and sparkly, with material getting ejected effectively. But once we reach some depth, material starts to get caught on the side walls, rather than flying away. It starts forming a bead there, hindering subsequent ejection even more. Soon all that our laser beam can reach is the inert slag of previous passes, and we stop making progress. Obvious solutions would be to dig our trenches wider than they are deep. That would take time and create more dirt. Or we could use some kind of air assist to ensure that waste products always get ejected all the way. That's what larger industrial laser cutters do. But I would prefer not to have a permanent metal dust storm in my lab if possible. My favorite solution so far is alternating cut parameters. I'll take a few passes with short pulse widths, making depth progress and creating lots of fine dust followed by one slow, hot cleanup pass with a long pulse width. I don't know exactly what it does with our dust buildup, but it gets a hole done within an acceptable length of time. It's not fast, it's 2mm steel after all, but it's certainly faster than all the preparation for and spinning up of my CNC machine. Which I can now do again thanks to the com marker before, an incredibly versatile, powerful component around which you can build yourself a safe laser machine. Thanks to you for watching. I'll zip and upload all my light burn projects I've used in this video, just in case anybody needs some recipes to start with. I'll also put an affiliate link to Commarkas laser engravers in the video description. If you use that to buy one, I'm getting a small commission without costing you anything extra. Alright, have a good one. See you soon.